Everybody needs beauty, as well as bread, places to play in and pray in, where nature may heal and give strength to body and soul. John Muir In the mid-1800s, the American Industrial Revolution was well underway. Cities rose and gold was discovered in the West. However, America's rampant race towards progress left the devastation of wilderness in its wake. Millions of acres of forests were felled, mountains blasted and laid waste for mines. Bears were hunted for sport and the bison were nearly exterminated. But one man boldly took a stand to preserve the natural world for generations to come. This man was John Muir, and his bold stand for preserving nature rewrote the destiny of our planet Earth. Progress versus Preservation how John Muir's stand shaped the ethos of the nation. Born in 1838 in Dunbar, Scotland, Muir was an intellect from the very beginning. Although he worked on the farm, he read voraciously. In his 20s, he was a brilliant inventor. One day as he worked, a sharp nail went straight into his eye. In the following months, with bandaged eyes, he despaired and vowed to see all of God's creation if he were to ever see again. His eyesight returned and a changed man set off on his famous thousand-mile walk, making his way to the Yosemite Valley, where he was rendered speechless. It was by far the grandest of all the special temples of nature I was ever permitted to enter, he wrote. He experienced nature with every fiber of his being. He celebrated trees by going up, crawling up into the very tops of them and letting storms batter so that he understood what a storm felt like to a tree. While roaming Yosemite, Muir was outraged by the exploitation he witnessed. Thousands of acres of meadows were destroyed by sheep grazing. Forests were set on fire to pave way for mining operations. Illegal squatters set up tourism rackets with impunity and even plotted to change the course of Nevada Falls to make room for a hotel. Muir penned his outrage in Yosemite Glaciers, a soaring article for the New York Tribune in 1871. His unadulterated passion for nature flowed through his pen. And Muir has that language, this rapturous, religious, rhetorical set of images that he has at his fingertips. And he maps them onto his concrete experiences out in these natural settings in a way that makes them transcendent. As his writings gained popularity, his fame grew and he was visited by esteemed intellectuals from all over the nation who wanted to tour the wilderness with him. Each returned home with a newfound wonder for nature. For 200 years before Muir, nature was seen as an unlimited resource made for humans to use. The emphasis in society was purely on progress, development. There was not even a thought about protecting nature because the only thing that nature was good for was as a resource. Wildlife suffered too. Bison had numbered at 60 million in the plains of America. At the turn of the century, only 2,000 remained. 67 species of birds faced extinction just to support trivial fashion trends and hats. Muir's ideas for preservation had fortuitous timing. The mid-1800s saw Charles Darwin publish his monumental work, and the idea of evolution revolutionized thinking. For the first time, people realized that man was not above nature, but a part of it. Muir is the inheritor of this thing that you see really coming in a lot of ways from the transcendentalists, um, people like Emerson and Thoreau. In 1883, the Northern Pacific Railroad was completed, bringing it with it many exploitative commercial interests. Local Californian officials held financial stakes in all the industries and stood to profit from the logging, mining, tourist, and hunting activities. $37 million worth of timber was stolen from public land that was protected by lax state laws. Muir, backed by the influential editor of the Century Magazine, Robert Underwood Johnson, who had spirited articles about the urgency of designating Yosemite a national park and preserving its beauty. Muir's fiery stand became the platform for advocacy in Washington. Muir was bitterly opposed by the corrupt local politicians and their commercial partners. Any fool can destroy trees, he wrote. They cannot run away. And even if they could, they would be destroyed, chased and hunted down, as long as fun or a dollar could be got off their bark hides. Thankfully, Muir's writing stirred preservationism in public consciousness. Millions of letters and petitions poured into Congress. And on October 1st, 1890, Muir won and Yosemite was made a national park. Buoyed by this initial success, 
Muir then made it his goal to get legislation passed for other parks around the nation and took to the pen. In 1892, Muir founded the Sierra Club, and a battle began between those who sought to preserve the land for all and those who sought commercial interests in it for themselves. Many prominent intellectuals joined Muir in his battles for preservation. It's a whole group of people from all walks of life who are really kind of coming to the idea that the unique landscape and the wild places in America are really a national treasure and a thing that can't be replaced once they're lost. Muir began lobbying heavily for the creation of a national park system. He envisioned the great American landscapes as a property co-owned by every single American. He saw the national park idea as the Declaration of Independence applied to the landscape. In 1903, President Theodore Roosevelt visited Yosemite and asked to camp alone with Muir for three days. The two men hit it off, and Muir urged Roosevelt to create a national federal system that would protect the country's wild places. Galvanized by Muir's ideas, Roosevelt went on to establish 150 national forests, 18 national monuments, and five national parks. Muir's last battle was to save the ecological marvel, the Hetch Hetchy Valley inside of Yosemite National Park from being flooded by a dam. In 1906, a calamitous earthquake and fire destroyed the city of San Francisco. The politicians of San Francisco, who owned financial stakes in the Pacific Gas and Electric Company, had coveted a dam at Hetch Hetchy since 1890, ostensibly to provide drinking water for the city. The earthquake provided them with an excellent excuse to renew their fight. All proposals by Muir and the Sierra Club for alternate dam sites were rejected. Muir, supported by the Sierra Club, bitterly opposed the dam. The proponents hailed the project as humanitarian and painted Muir as idealistic, misguided, and a misanthrope. In 1913, after seven long years, the dam proponents won, and Hetch Hetchy drowned under a reservoir. But it soon became apparent to the public that they had been conned. Even though the bill prohibited it, the Pacific Gas and Electric Company was awarded the rights to the hydroelectric power at Hetch Hetchy. They continue to profit in millions of dollars, even today. The loss of Hetch Hetchy caused a battle cry of never again to go up in the nation. Citizens realized how commercial interests could manipulate public opinion for profit monitoring and rallied to join the Sierra Club in droves. The year was 1914 and Muir was 76. He continued to tirelessly write even when he was diagnosed with pneumonia. When the great man passed away on Christmas Eve that year, all around his hospital room lay pages of his manuscript, Travels in Alaska. He fought for preservation for 25 years, wrote 12 books and over 300 articles in his lifetime. John Muir used inspiration as a form of activism. America's best idea, that's what they call the national parks. And just 150 years ago, they didn't exist. Yet today, we have 6,500 parks in nearly 100 countries worldwide, with over 835 million acres of land set aside for protection. It was conceived of and created by the thousands of people inspired by John Muir's philosophy. People from every conceivable background, rich people who through their wealth and their philanthropy created parks, poor people who gave pennies to help save the Great Smokies, a descendant of slaves who helped save Biscayne National Park, immigrants who fell in love with the place and through their artistry uh, helped bring that place to people's attention. Muir's legacy lives on through the Sierra Club with the membership of over 2.4 million citizens. It was key in creating the National Park Service and fought for groundbreaking environmental acts such as the Wilderness Act, the Clean Air Act, and the Clean Water Act and taking a stand on ecological issues such as climate change. Without Muir issuing that initial spiritual call for preservation, we would likely not have any spectacular wilderness left in the world. He considered it simply his sacred duty to fight for a changed ethos in the nation. He sensed nature glowing with God's radiance. The spiritual impulse and the bold sin Muir took changed the ethical underpinnings of our world view towards the planet. The most important person in the history of the National Park is John Muir. We are still basking in the warmth of the half-life of his ideas. By immersing himself in nature and asking us to do the same, Muir showed us that to experience life, we simply had to go out into nature and discover our true self. For, like you said, it is by going out that we are truly going in.